okay? So medications for hypertension. So blood, all these guys, the whole reason we went over all those things is because these, that's, that's gonna help you understand how the medication works, right? So these are the medications. A lot of these we already know. We already know about ACE inhibitors and ARBs. So that makes us, and we also, also know about beta blockers. We should know a little bit about calcium blockers. We talked about them before. We'll touch on them again. We talked about MRAs last week, right? And alpha agents are new. Nitrates we talked about last week. So what's new is alpha agents and thiazide diuretics and Rogaine, right? Minoxidil. So it makes it's a little less scary in that, in that fashion, okay? So every blood pressure medication ever is gonna do what to your blood pressure? It's gonna lower your blood pressure. Otherwise it didn't get, F, it wouldn't have got FDA approved. So I got, a, I got a blood pressure medication. What does it do? It raises your blood pressure. Is it for hypertensive patients or for hypotensive patients, right? Because there are medications that can raise your blood pressure, right? But all these meds are going to lower your blood pressure. So we're not going to put hypotension, hypertension, hypertension, hypertension for every one of these side effects. We know that is inherent. That's going to happen. And when you have low blood pressure as a side effect, what do you get? That's from low cardiac outputs. You get chest pain, shortness of breath, hypotension, confusion, right? And then confusion can lead to syncope and lead to falls, right? And all those things are gonna to lead to, that's a, that's, a, that's a problem, right? That's a fall risk with all these medications. And what's that called? That's called orthostasis, is when your blood pressure drops when you rise, right? Because usually your body responds to a low blood pressure. It's like, oh, blood pressure's low, and it's gonna raise your blood pressure. But well, guess what you did? You, you stopped that, right? You gave, you gave it SNS blocker, right? You gave a medication that vasodilates. So your body's used to putting out a certain signal to raise your blood pressure, but now you're vasodilating even more because of medication. So it's going, you're gonna fail, right? And you're also gonna fall. So yeah, so what are the interventions for orthostasis? We'll talk about at the end of this section, kind of just how to manage orthostasis in general, but definitely gonna check the blood pressure. They should check the blood pressure on a, a good blood pressure equipment, not one that's bought on WISH, but one that has been validated by their doctor, right? So that it is an effective way to manage their blood pressure so that they know before they take the blood pressure medication, their blood pressure should be good, right? So when, with hypertensive patients, we want to give ACE inhibitors or ARBs, so that's A, Okay, so you don't have to know like who does what and what does what, that's more of a prescriber's job. Well, the, way I've, the reason I bring this up here is because it's a nice way to know ACD is for hypertensive patients. So A for ACE inhibitors or ARBs, whichever one, okay. C for calcium blockers, which variety, DHP or non-DHP? DHP, because DHP is the doorbell that's literally on the vascular smooth muscle. So we want to inhibit that, right? Because if you hit that doorbell, it's gonna vasoconstrict. We don't want vasoconstriction. We don't want an increase in afterload. We want to vasodilate, okay? And then D is a new medication that is our diuretics of the thiazide variety. So we'll talk about thiazide diuretics. Loop diuretics were for CHF. Loop diuretics are not here, right? So A, C, D, it'd be nice if there's another C in there, but it's A, C, D, and more Ds, all right? There's more diuretics we can do, there's more other things we can add, alpha agents, nitrates, et cetera, minoxidil and Rogaine if we need one or two. All right, hey, you wanna grow a beard? Okay, say no more, all right? It's gonna fix your blood pressure too, all right? So we got A, C, and D, all right? So C, here's our DHP calcium blockers. They're inhibiting that smooth muscle, all right? That smooth muscle, if that calcium got into that smooth muscle, it'll vasoconstrict. So our DHPs stop that, right? They stop the DHP calcium channels, right? It's a calcium channel blocker. And then our blood, our heart's pumping blood out to our periphery. Beta blockers will reduce inotropy a little bit, but also beta blockers reduce what? The ventricular remodeling, which is important because if they didn't, then our heart, we're gonna get to heart failure, all right? So that's not good. And also hypertension itself puts more stress on the heart. Right, and then the SNS kick or the uh, yeah SNS and other things kick in and say, hey, you want to be stronger because the blood pressure is super high out there. Let me get you bigger rims, bigger wheels. Let's get you a, a spoiler, and you're gonna look really cool. Let's let's take off the muffler as well, so you sound super loud. All right, so that's that's and that's it's not gonna be it's not gonna have good outcomes. All right, and then we have ACE inhibitors and ARBs. ACE inhibitors and ARBs are going to stop the angiotensin II from doing its thing. All right, it's gonna stop the production of angiotensin II. Or it's going to stop the receptors uh, from accepting angiotensin II because angiotensin II binds to those angiotensin receptors, and then it causes vaso what? 
causes angiotensin, causes tensin of the angios, causes vasoconstriction. And again, remember, they don't want to admit they're wrong. They said, oh, they're angiotensin 2 receptors, right? Angiotensin 2 binds to angiotensin 2 receptors? No, it's angiotensin 1. So what are we talking about? All right, so angiotensin, yes, we have angiotensin 1 receptors there, and angiotensin 2 will bind to those. So it's not, you, you call them ARBs as in angiotensin receptor blockers, right? So ARBs are going to stop this process, which is the angiotensin 2, from binding to those vessels, and will then lead to vaso what? Vasodilation and hypotension. Well, not hypotension, but a reduction in our blood pressure. And what's our blood pressure target? Less than 130 over 80. That's our goal, is to get our blood pressure less than 130 over 80. Okay? So beta blockers are going to help. Calcium blockers will help. ACE inhibitors will help. All these things will help. But, you know, ACD is usually our, you're going to find your hypertensive patient on those medications. All right, so we have uh, nitric oxide. We'll talk about some of those guys. Our nitrates are going to do that. They're going to help out nitric, uh, get more nitric oxide flow in. Nitric oxide is a vasodilator. Um, we've got potassium channels involved in here. K channels are not represented here. I think on the previous slide they were, but that's what, where minoxidil works. Alpha agents, we kind of touched on those. We're going to either block alpha-1 or we're going to potentiate alpha-2 because alpha-2 is the off switch for the SNS. Okay, so in the brain here, we've got central acting alpha-2 agonists, right? This is going to overview of all of our blood pressure meds, all right? So let's take a break, and then we'll talk a little bit more about the blood pressure meds. All right, so medications for hypertension. All right, so again, this table is going to summarize the next couple of slides. I think I did it in three slides has all your medications for hypertension. So this is going to be the overview of those. What is your takeaway? The other three slides are going to explain these symptoms, explain these side effects, explain the teaching that might need to go with it. And of course, a lot of these we went over with CHF and sometimes some with the EKG, beta blockers are beta blockers are beta blockers. There's not much difference there, right? So you can see on the considerations and the side effects to kind of give some highlighting for you. Like angioedema, is that a serious situation? Yeah. That's pretty serious, right? What about a hyperkalemia? That's pretty serious. But bradycardia, is that, is that cool? No, right? So it's not as cool as angioedema, but it is not a, it's a bad situation. So which one of these hypertensive meds cause bradycardia? Those two. That's it, right? So if we want to ask you a question on which one of these medications cause bradycardia, like a SATA, those are the two, right? And then we have like medications that you would avoid in acute kidney injury. In acute kidney injury, you're not getting rid of stuff. Right, your kidneys are not working, and your you can have a buildup of potassium. So usually the potassium kind of goes hand in hand. All right, and of course knowing which one does afterload, which one does preload. We've been you know using those ten dollar words left and right today. Those guys, you have to know what those those are, unfortunately, right? So you have to know does this medication raise afterload or does it reduce afterload? Does it raise preload or, or decrease preload? Does it have no effect on preload? Does it have no effect on afterload? Right? So you have to recognize that. So we've summarized it all here for you, right? All right, so antihypertensive meds. All right, so these are ABCs, or I guess that's not, not a good way to say it because it's usually ACD, right? So beta blockers are added in here. Usually beta blockers are added at the end when someone just has plain old hypertension and no CHF. But if someone has CHF and hypertension, which kind of medication do we use? We use MBC for the beta blockers for CHF, right? So we use usually the non-specific ones. So C being carvedilol, right? Carvedilol is non-specific, whereas M and B are a part of manbabe, right? Manbabe are just beta one only specific. Are those really going to lower blood pressure? Not much, right? They're really going to do focus more on reducing the heart rate and reducing ventricular remodeling. Someone has CHF and hypertension. Carvedilol is where it's at, right? Because that ventricular remodeling is what's going to cut is going to cause worsening of their CHF, right? They're going to come in and say, hey, I know how to make ventricles, and then it comes out not looking like ventricles at all. It's going to be, it's going to worsen their CHF. It's going to make it less strong. It's going to make it more dilated. It's bad, right? This also applies to the kidneys as well. The kidneys vessels in there, the glomerulus, can get remodeled as well. So ACE inhibitors and ARBs and beta blockers are going to prevent ventricular remodeling and save the kidneys too, which is nice, all right? Other things just to finish up, beta blockers. Beta blockers are going to do what to the heart rate? They're going to lower the heart rate. They are beta blocking, right? They are stopping the beta one or, or their, the beta one receptor activity, which is increasing 
uh, our heart rate increase in contractility. So because of that, if it's going to decrease contractility, should we give it if someone's coming into the hospital with decreased contractility of CHF variety? No. But on discharge, it's okay. It's okay on discharge to say, okay, you're out of this acute stage. Let's give you this medication. The benefits outweigh the risks when you are out of the woods. Okay? So you avoid it for what? For acute CHF exacerbation. Okay? So, so avoid an acute CHF exacerbation. Another piece about beta blockers is you avoid sudden discontinuance of them. Don't, don't just stop them right away. Someone comes to the hospital and you stop them right away. Your body can now, it's like, oh, now I'm free. Now I can play. And it's going to cause a rebound hypertension. So that's not great. There's another medication that has that too in the previous slides. So those are the two medications that can cause rebound hypertension in a hypertensive crisis, if you will, All right, which is a complication of hypertension. So that's beta blockers. And then ACE inhibitors and ARBs are great for the heart. They reduce cardiac remodeling, but they also reduce vessel remodeling. Remember our hypertension is doing donuts in the parking lot. It's doing donuts in the vessels. And those vessels are going to kind of scar over some more. They're going to fibrose and become narrowed in of themselves. And then of course the ASCVD is not going to help, but giving ACE inhibitors and ARBs is going to help prevent that. So those are usually the first line medications. Remember it's ACDC or ACD at least. So ACE inhibitors or ARBs, you're never going to be on both, right? Why would you be on an ARB versus an ACE? Because they developed angioedema. Angioedema does not happen with ARBs. It does happen with ACEs. What about the cough? The cough happens like almost 35, 40% of the time when someone's on an ACE. They go, roo, roo. It sounds like a seal's in the room. Like, what is going on? Right? You're on, a, you're on an ACE inhibitor, right? So that can happen still with ARBs, but to a less effect. Right? And also, ARBs are less effective, so that's not great either. Right? So if you, you can deal with it, you should be on an ACE inhibitor. Okay? So it causes coughing, causes angioedema or anginally jolie, right? causes some problems there. And then also, it's going to decrease afterload or preload. Trick question. It's going to do both because it's going to stop. RAS has two A's in it. Right? It's going to stop the A2. Right, angiotensin 2, which angiotenses, so that's going to decrease afterload, and it stops aldosterone. And aldosterone is a, or a hormone that gets released from the adren adrenal glands, and it goes to the kidneys. And what does it do in the kidneys? It's going to, I think I have it here maybe, and it's going to go, aldosterone go to the kidneys, and it's going to absorb sodium and water in the kidneys in exchange for what? Because you have to maintain the force at all times, right? You have to make sure you're putting a positive for a positive. So we're going to put a sodium in the urine. Water's going to follow. You're going to diurese in exchange for what? A potassium. And it's the only way your body can get rid of potassium. So if you have, if you block the only way you can get rid of potassium, what's going to happen to your potassium levels in your body? It's going to go up. So you have high risk for hyperkalemia. So if someone has acute kidney injury, they could be at risk for hyperkalemia in of itself with that. So you don't want to, do, you don't want to combine the two. But again, when they're out of the woods, you can go ahead and restart the ACE inhibitor ARB. That's going to be preventing the glomerular remodeling, the vessels of the, of the, the nephron, of the, of the kidneys. So it decreases afterload and preload. And just on the same story, what, is, what do beta blockers do? Do they reduce preload or afterload? Afterload. I mean, you can get particular and say, well, it's going to stop the beta-1 receptor on the red, on the red angiotensin system. It's going to stop the RAS also, and therefore that might do it too. But really, its primary goal is to decrease afterload. All right, and then we have calcium blockers, the DHP calcium blockers, and all of them end with what? Dipene, right? I didn't say it, but all ACEs end with what? Pril, and all ARBs end with? Sartan, and all beta blockers end with? And there's no exceptions, which is nice. Calcium blockers, there are exceptions, and it's based on the category of calcium blockers. There's two of them, right? There's DHP and non-DHP. Which ones are for, for arrhythmias? Non so your non-DHP are for arrhythmias. Those guys are your rap mill and deltiazem. Your DHP ones are the ones that work how we expect. We have a little doorbell right here on the muscle. We're going to send the impulse down to squeeze our muscles, like it might be like norepinephrine or SNS fiber comes down and says, hey, it's time to release, time to vasoconstrict. So it releases norepi right there. That creates a muscle action potential that, that propagates across the muscle. It goes down little synaptic, little clefts there in the muscle, and then it's going to depolarize that calcium channel, that DHP calcium channel, and it's going to activate it, right? It's going to press the doorbell. When that happens, calcium get, uh, gets released 
and calcium then does its thing, which is activating things. I mean, in that case, it's going to cause contraction. Do we want that? No, we give a couch channel blocker to block that whole process, right? So we give a couch channel blocker to stop vasoconstriction. Therefore, we get vasodilation. And we'd mentioned before, if you get vasodilation in the periphery, you're also getting vasodilation in the brain with what side effect? Headache, not aneurysm. Aneurysm happens with hypertension. Okay, so we get a headache and we get a peripheral vasodilation. So we get what side effect? Edema, and it's actually related to the dose of calcium blocker. The more calcium blocker give, the more peripheral edema they get. All right. So, and they get fatigued because their muscles don't get to the blood flow they need, and you get you can all the symptoms of hypotension. That was for every uh, medication, right? Every antihypertensive medication, and also it decreases contractility directly. It doesn't just do smooth muscles (DHB). It also does cardiac muscles. To extent, so we don't want to give these with someone with acute CHF, whether on discharge or not. You just don't give them. Okay, they should not be given. All right, what else on here? So we got the beta blockers there. We got the calcium blockers working on the heart. They also work in the periphery, out over here, right on those, those vessels. And we're going to mention some of these other drugs on um, the subsequent slides. So diuretics, so we did A, C, and now we got diuretics, right? Which diuretics is the one we usually use? It's thiazide diuretics with uh, hypertension. All diuretics, diurese, right? They make you dia, which means through. It makes me, it make you have through urine or urine go through you, right? So it's gonna make you pee out stuff, right? Whether it does it by, usually it's sodium is the one that's the enemy here. We're gonna stop sodium reabsorption in some fashion. If we stop it with, by inhibiting aldosterone, that's called a MRA, right? Because another fancy word for aldosterone is a mineralic corticoid, right? And there's only one of them, so I don't know why they just say aldosterone receptor, but it's going to those spironolactone and eplerinone we talked about last week, those are stopping aldosterone's function. And they, they stop it specifically at the end of the, of the, uh, the ride here, right? You dump into the, here's the afferent, right? You could dump into the glomerulus right here. You come into the glomerulus. You go for a little a little ride. I right? just watched on YouTube the Alpine sleds with no no tracks. That's pretty fun. You go all the way down the hill, and then you have to then you're gonna end up in the toilet, right? So unless you got reabsorbed, unless you got chosen as a lucky one, right? So glucose gets reabsorbed, sodium gets reabsorbed in exchange for potassium at the very very end there, all right? So our MRAs are gonna work at the end here, all right? So our thought our we got here MRAs. Our desmopressin, loop diuretics, that's, that's a different variety. Where am I at here? Acetazolamide, and then we got our MRAs here, potassium sparing, our spironolactone. They're going to work right there, the distal convoluted tubule. Why can't I see it? Maybe it's not on that one. All right, so that's the idea with the uh, MRAs. They're going to stop sodium reabsorption, right? What are diuretics? They are stopping sodium. Sodium wants to get back into the, into the body. And it says, nope, there's a no sodium flub. Sorry, you're, you're not able to come back, all right? And therefore, it's going to bring all its water friends with it, and you're going to diuretes. So thiazide diuretics, those are the ones we use with hypertension, all right? So hydrochlorothiazide, chlorothiazide, thiazide, that has many different varieties, but hydrochlorothiazide and metolazone are the two thiazide diuretics we start patients on, and those will decrease preload or afterload. And decrease preload because volume is volume and volume is preload, right? So we're, we're stopping the reabsorption of sodium and we are going to pee out sodium and water, right? And it works right over here, right? Also in the distal convoluted tubule and it's going to, uh, because of that, because of a few other mechanisms, it's going to have side effects of what's called hyperglucose, right? So hyperglucose is a way to remember all the symptoms of, or the side effects of thiazide diuretics, right? So it's going to hyper G, so it's gonna raise your glucose. So is it good for a diabetic patient? No. And what about hyperlipidemia? It's gonna hyperlipid, GL, right? L for lipids. It's gonna raise your lipid count, all right? And then uric acid, we'll talk more about uric acid next, next semester. And then calcium, it's gonna raise your calcium level as well. So hyperglucose is gonna be a side effect, right? It's like hyperglucan. It's going to go ahead and raise your glucose, lipids, uric acid, and calcium. Those are your side effects of thiazide diuretics. Okay, so we're stopping sodium reabsorption with thiazides. We can stop it also with uh, MRAs, or mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists. 
they're stopping the reabsorption of sodium or stopping that one ch exchange channel, which exchanges sodium and water. Okay, so you can also see this little JG complex here, little JG complex, that's what kind of triggers the whole RAS in of itself, right? All it's doing at all times is like just tasting the urine, right? It's a urine taster and it's gonna taste it. Mm. It's too salt. It's not enough salt, so it's going to tr trigger the whole RAS system and reabsorb more salt and water. Or it's also checking the pressure out there. The pressure is not great through the through the kidneys. It's going to trigger the RAS system as well. And also look, the beta one receptors there. We got beta one receptors. The SNS triggers the RAS system. They're all interconnected. So you have little nerve endings that will also trigger the RAS when you have an SNS response. So when we give a beta one blocker, it's going to also inhibit the RAS system. All right, so other agents. So these are the, pick up the, these are other things we can add. It's usually a person that has really, really bad hypertension. You're gonna see these agents on board. We have alpha agents. So alpha agents can be either alpha one, what do you think, antagonists or agonists? They're gonna be antagonists. See, alpha one receptors normally get hit with norepinephrine from the SNS, and that will then cause vasoconstriction. So you want to antagonize that. We're gonna give an alpha-1 blocker. We're gonna stop the alpha-1s from responding. The medication is gonna take the place of alpha-1, right? So the medication itself, like prazosin, is going to bind to those alpha-1 receptors and stop norepi from attaching to it. No norepi attached to it. Then you get vaso what? You get vasodilation. Okay, so prazosin and doxazosin, those are medications for, uh, that are alpha-1 blockers. And they're also, you also have alpha-1 receptors on the smooth muscle of your prostate, at least males do. All right, so you're gonna have alpha-1, so it's gonna cause you to pee better for uh, prostate issues. So if someone has prostate issues and hypertension, I got just the thing for you, All right? I got prazosin. The nice thing is it it's, it's ends in sin, so it's SNS inhibition. So those guys get an award for naming convention. All right, so these are alpha-1 antagonists. They inhibit the SNS, specifically the alpha-1s, right? They block SNS action on the arterioles, causing vasodilation. They also block it on the prostate for urinary retention due to BPH. And then alpha-2 agonists. So alpha-2 agonists, remember we have this process here where norepi gets released, right? And it binds to the receptor. And then some of it comes back and goes to the alpha-2 receptor to let it know there's plenty of norepi in this synaptic cleft and there's plenty of norepi action happening. So what we do is we give a medication that's going to go in there and fool it. We're going to give clonidine. Clonidine is going to go in there. It's going to attach to the alpha-2 receptor and say, everything's fine here. Nothing to worry. It's all good. There's plenty of norepi. I don't know what you're talking about. There's no reason to come down here. It's all good, right? It actually works in the CNS. So it works in the brainstem itself. And because it works in the brainstem, it stops all SNS signals past the brainstem. So one of the SNS signals is going to the heart, and therefore you have decreased heart rate as a side effect, right? So you have decreased heart rate as a side effect for clonidine, and decreased heart rate as a side effect of what other antihypertensive? Beta blockers, right? Beta blockers are going to stop the beta-1 receptors directly, and then clonidine stops the SNS from even going out, right? So we're stopping the SNS here, or we're stopping the SNS here. Either way, you stop the SNS, right? So that's how clonidine and um, beta blockers lower the heart rate, but the alpha-1 receptors, alpha-2 receptors, we can manipulate to help someone with, with hypertension, right? And also clonidine was originally used for anesthesia. Like when your SNS is firing up, you're, you're more alert, right? You're more alert, you're able to fight, you're able to run away from a bear, you're able to do things. So if you were to block it, essentially, you're going to get more tired. So it used to be used as a sedative, all right? And we still use it in ICU as a sedative as well. We use the IV form of it, which is another fun word to say, to give it, we give it IV, it's because of IV clonidine, and it's, it suppresses their, um, their agitation, okay? It's called dexmedetomidine. And then nitrates. So nitrates, we talked about with, um, CHF, it's usually another agent we use for advanced CHF. It's not one of our first couple things we give, but nitrates can be used to vasodilate and they are going to potentiate nitric oxide here. So nitric oxide, it's just basically a fuel for her to make more nitric oxide. We give put more nitrates into the, into the steam engine and out comes more nitric oxide. Nitric oxide causes vasodilation. 
So what inhibits nitrate, nitric oxide is oxygen free radicals or reactive oxygen species. So all these free radicals that develop due to hypertension, due to other smoking, all the other things that are you know, sedentary lifestyle, inflammation, we get more oxygen free radicals, we can inhibit those with hydralazine. So hydralazine inhibits the free radicals that inhibit the nitric oxide. So it's either way we have like, we kind of categorize them both as nitrates and you can be on both of them. It's okay to be on like beta blockers are on one beta blocker. ACE inhibitors are on one ACE inhibitor, but nitrates you can be on both hydralazine and ISDN or isosorbide dinitrate. And since the vasodilates, it's going to cause a reduction in what? An afterload. Why is it reduced preload? Because this is one of the only drugs that vasodilates the arteries and the veins. So it dilates everything, right? So all the blood gets dilated and less blood returns to the heart because all the blood's now in the periphery. So we get reduction in afterload and a reduction in preload. All right, and then minoxidil. So minoxidil is an agent that opens all the potassium channels. It's kind of like a dentist, you know, how it opens potassium channels. But here we're doing it on the peripheral vessels and it's going to make the vessels uh, difficult to depo uh, remember that signal that's going across the, the spoon vessel and that spoon vessel then has to trigger the calcium channel. Well, what if we hyperpolarize it to the point where that signal can't get transported or can't be propagated? So that's kind of what minoxidil is doing. It's opening all the cold water channels, all the potassium channels, and therefore we get vasodilation as a side effect, or not side effect, but as an intended effect, right? The side effect is hair growth because you start vasodilating the bald spot. Now the bald spot gets more water, it gets more blood flow, it gets more oxygen supply, and that's now you can get more hair growth because hair needs oxygen and blood, right? So that's how minoxidil works. Okay, so we got, there's an overview here. We got our hydralazine, minoxidil, calcium blockers are just, all they're doing is vasodilating. They have no effect on the heart. If you vasodilate way too much, what kind of side effect will the heart get? Well, you get hypotension, but then the hypotension will trigger the baroreceptors. The baroreceptors will trigger the SNS, and then you'll get what side effect? Reflexive tachycardia, right? Reflexive tachycardia is a result of too much hypotension. Right, we got thiazide diuretics and potassium wasted diuretics in the kidneys. That's going to reduce preload or afterload. It's going to reduce preload, right? Preload. All right, so we're going to reduce preload. What's an example of a potassium sparing diuretic? Spironolactone or plerinone, all right? The MRIs. Thiazide diuretic is potassium wasting or potassium sparing? It's potassium wasting. What's another potassium waste diuretic given for CHF patients? Furosemide. Okay. So metoprolol, that's going to stop the beta-1 receptors at the heart. And also it's going to stop the beta-1 receptors at the, at the uh, JG complex, for the, which is the beginning of the RAS system. So that's, that's double duty there. All right. ACE inhibitors and ARBs, those guys are going to stop the RAS system in of itself. And therefore we get a decrease in what? Preload or afterload? A trick question, it's both. It's gonna do stop, it's two A's, right? It's gonna stop angina two, so we get decrease afterload. It's gonna stop aldosterone, which is preload, okay? And we got aldosterone antagonist, which we mentioned, that's working at the kidneys. What else are we missing? Clonidine, we talked about works in the brainstem, works in the CNS. It's stopping the outflow of SNS signals, right? It's, it's fooling it into thinking there's plenty of norepi being released. All right, so symptoms of hypertension. This is easy, none, all right? There, there aren't any symptoms until you get complications. So the complications are damage due to hypertension. It's damage, it's what's called end organ damage. We got damage to the brain, you're gonna get, they're getting you a head to toe. Damage to the brain and then to the eyes, right? In the brain, it can cause both types of strokes. It can cause ischemic stroke, it can also cause hemorrhagic stroke. And to the eyes, it can cause those vessels to rupture and you get retinopathy or hypertensive retinopathy. Okay. And these are the symptoms that you would get from those disease processes. So next week we'll talk about stroke. And when you have a stroke, you start losing function of that vessel uh, that fed that area. So if your vessel vessel's feeding your, your temporal lobe, well, your temporal lobe is responsible for doing what? As the Broca's area and Wernicke's area and Particularly gyruses and such, that is for talking, right? So talk, you're not going to be able to talk good. You're going to have slurred speech. 
So it's, these are called focal nerve deficits, where you can't do something specifically. I cannot move my right arm, I cannot speak, I cannot see, I cannot pee, all these little specific things. I cannot walk, my gait is impaired. Those are specific things that are symptoms of a stroke, right? So hypertension causes both hemorrhagic and ischemic strokes. The symptoms are the same for both, which is nice. All right, eyes, they're gonna have vision changes, so they should get their eyes checked at least yearly. If they do get checked, they'll see what's called papilledemia. They'll, they'll see like, almost, it looks like aneurysms of the eye, eye vessels. All right, and then, so you can see in the back here, the eyes start getting misbehaving because of the hypertension. The heart gets affected. So the heart gets hypertrophied at first. It's gonna start putting on more muscle to try to overcome this increase in afterload or preload. Afterload, the afterload is a measure of hypertension, right? So if you have hypertension, that's gonna raise your blood pressure. That's more work for the left ventricle to do. So that's gonna, you're gonna get LV strain. The left ventricle is gonna work harder and harder and harder until it fails. And it fail, can fail in two capacities. It can fail because did it get enough oxygen? That's called an MI, right? Or it can fail because it just, it just gives out over time and that's called CHF. And MI can get you to CHF or hypertension directly can get you to CHF. Vascular problems, aneurysms, not only in your brain, but also in your periphery. And that's a tearing pain. You can, it's literally your vessels tearing apart and you can feel that tearing pain. If it's, a, if it's a, your ascending aorta out of your heart, it can be chest pain. And it's, if it's tearing and you have difference in blood pressures in both arms, that can be as life-threatening, all right? And then kidneys, we get CKD over time. And we'll talk about the symptoms of CKD more in, in uh, in renal, in our renal lecture, but you're gonna not do the things the kidney does, which is produce hemoglobin or stimulate the production of hemoglobin. It's not going to get rid of fluid and it's not gonna get rid of waste products. So we get all those symptoms attached to it. All right, so then what else can happen? So you can, if you're, how do you know someone has, uh, those, it could come in with these symptoms and they have, and it could be due to their hypertension or they could come in just with a really, really high blood pressure, blood pressure greater than 180 over 120. That is considered a hypertensive crisis. So hypertensive crisis is when someone's blood pressure is greater than 180 over 120. And it could be two, two things can happen. It can be asymptomatic or it could be symptomatic. Symptomatic would be they got a brain bleed. Symptomatic could be they have an MI. Symptomatic could be they have kidney dysfunction. Symptomatic could be they can't see, right? Those, those are just, you have symptoms of these complications. That's symptoms of end organ damage, right? Or target organ damage. If you have end organ damage, Right, for hypertensive crisis is an umbrella term. If you have end organ damage, it's called hypertensive emergency. You gotta fix it right away. If someone's blood pressure is greater than 180 over 120 and they have a stroke, we gotta fix that. We gotta fix the blood pressure. And that gets a little bit hairy and we'll talk more about blood pressure management with strokes. But if they have an aortic aneurysm and they're ruptured their aorta and there's blood flowing out of it at 190 systolic, do you wanna reduce that blood pressure? Yes, and that, that's where you reduce the blood pressure like immediately within like 10 to 20 minutes. All right, so I have an aortic dissection. We reduce the blood pressure, bam, within 20 minutes. We give a beta agonist, right? Sorry, a, a, a IV beta blocker, excuse me. So you give an IV beta blocker, like Esmolol is a, a IV beta blocker we can give, and that can lower the blood pressure immediately to about 90 to 100 points, or 90 to 100 um, systolic. We wanna really reduce that blood pressure so we don't bleed out even more, okay? And then if it's not a stroke and it's not a, an aneurysm, we just reduce the blood pressure by 25%, all right? So 25% every 24 hours. So here comes your math skills. So two, your blood pressure is 200 systolic. What should it be the next day? Hmm? It's 20%, 25%. 150 or 175? 150, all right? So yeah, so that's 25% reduction. That's your goal for the next day, all right? So if it's like one, it's like, look, look, look at my blood pressure, it's 110 over, over 70. It's like, that's way too much. You're gonna cause an actual stroke if you drop the blood pressure way too fast, okay? So if you wanna bring that blood pressure down slowly over 24 hours. All right, so then how do you do that? So how we do that is we can start the home meds. So if they can swallow, like they didn't have a stroke, you know, usually when you have a stroke, you sometimes can't swallow. But if they can swallow, they should take their home medications. And then what if they didn't take, like they're in the ER for 18 hours and they're on clonidine at home and no one gave them clonidine because no one did their medication reconciliation and no one gave them their, their clonidine from home. What's the risk factor for clonidine if you, if you don't, uh, don't take it? 
cause rebound hypertension. That's, that happens a lot, right? The patient's waiting to go to the med surge floor and they call a report and say, hey, I got a patient for you. Okay, what's the blood pressure? Oh, it's, it's 190 over, over 130. Oh, that's, not, that's a little bit too high. What, what happened? They didn't take their clonidine, right? We have to make sure that we are getting clonidine on its schedule. Otherwise, it can cause significant rebound hypertension. So we start PO meds, and then we can then give PRN IV push meds. We have hydralazine as IV push. We have labetalol as IV push. All right, these are just beta blockers. We're giving IV push and nitrates. We give IV push, right? And then we have drips, and you'll talk more about drips in ICU, but they're given IV nitroglycerin drip or an IV uh, calf channel blocker, micardipine. Those medications are bringing down the blood pressure safely. How safely? If they have no aneurysm and no stroke, how safely do you bring it down? By about... 25%, right? So that's our goal with it. So they can have target organ damage. So they have a stroke, they have heart problems, they have eye problems, or they can have just a high blood pressure, right? So we used to call that hypertensive urgency, but someone said that's, that's way too simple. You can't just call it hypertensive urgency if there's actually no other symptoms happening. You have to call it asymptomatic mark of the elevated blood pressure. Okay, you can leave now. All right, so that is not, that is not easier. Right, so there's emergency and urgency. So emergency means you have organ damage going on and your blood pressure is high. Or your blood pressure is high and there's no signs of organ damage. Okay, so these are complications of hypertension that can happen acutely that we have to bring down right away. So like in clinical, when you get a blood pressure that's super high, you need to bring it down, right? If you don't bring it down, they can start getting signs of end organ damage. Like, hey, my, blood, my patient is, not, is, not, is talking funny now. I've got slurred speech. What's the blood pressure? Well, shoot, it's, it's like 190 over 120. That, that's a problem. Okay? So that's our goal with bringing down the blood pressure. The symptoms of high blood pressure are asymptomatic until they start causing uh, end organ damage or target organ damage. So diagnostic tests, what kind of, how do you know someone has a high blood pressure? You just check, you check it, you check your blood pressure. If it's high, it's high. And there's all kinds of things that can happen and it gets really, really convoluted. But basically we know greater than 130 over 80-ish is bad. And sometimes they say 135 over 85, just I don't know why they can't use all the same targets. But greater than 130 over 80 is gonna be a uh, reason or a way you can say they have high blood pressure at home. And there's something called white coat syndrome where they get to the doctor's office and they get really nervous. They're gonna know my blood pressure's high. They're gonna, I have to take my blood pressure meds. I just ate McDonald's, I just had Chick-fil-A. They're gonna know. And then you get a really high blood pressure, okay? So they say, hey, if the blood pressure in the office is really, really high, like greater than 140 over 90, I believe. Or is it at here? 140 over 90, somewhere, this times, this times two, but uh, you know, if it's, I think it's, there's like a definitive one where I lost it. But if it's like definitively high, like over 160 over 110 even, all right, then they like, there it is, 180 over 110, you can't hide that. That's not white coat syndrome. All right, that means you just have high blood pressure. But they'll check your blood pressure again in a month and see if it comes down. And if it has come down, then great. But if it's still elevated over 140 over 90 at this point, then it's, it's considered hypertension. Okay, so they check your blood pressure in the office. They usually do three checks and they take the last two checks and average them. And the key thing with this though, to, to, um, and you talked about this also in uh, fundamentals was how to take a blood pressure, right? Make sure they are sitting upright, make sure they have, uh, they're not talking to you, make sure they're not you know, drinking excess fluids, especially caffeine. They're not smoking while they're taking the blood pressure. They're making sure they're, you know, they're as, as neutral as possible. Okay, keep feet flat on the floor, make sure they're not crossing their legs, make sure they're not doing, um, they've been resting for five minutes at least, right? And during the measurement, they're not moving around all the time. Make sure their arm is the level of their what? Of their heart, okay? And then they should be tracking this as well. They should, if they're doing this at home, so they can, and so they can then get a trend over time, okay? So if it's less than 130 over 80, you, have, you don't have hypertension. You might have free hypertension, but you don't have hypertension. But if it's greater than 130 over 80, especially if it's one office visit, two office visits, three office visits, you, you probably are going towards the way of having hypertension. All right, in the office, we want to do assess for target organ damage to get the head to toe. So stroke, that's probably, probably come to the hospital for that, not, not the office, but eyes, you can check the eyes to see if there's any eye damage, right? We can do labs to see if there's any kidney damage, if there's any heart damage. 
We can do an EKG to see if their heart is getting bigger or not. We can actually see on the EKG if someone has ventricular hypertrophy. You can, see, you can do an echocardiogram to see if they have any kind of problems with their heart. So we can do an echo as well. We can see if they have kidney problems by looking at their glomerulus function to see if the glomerulus is peeing out albumin, which it should not be. And we can assess that in, on a UA. And there's that, that ASCVD risk score that we talked about at ASCVD, which is a website where you punch in all your numbers and it tells you your cardiovascular risk, your risk of having these, these problems. Okay, so an ambulatory blood pressure monitor is a FDA approved device we can use to send them home and take their, it takes their blood pressure every one to two hours and they're supposed to write down in a journal what they were doing at those times they took it and when they feel they gotta stop. So why, why are you stopping? Again, my blood pressure is getting taken. All right, so you gotta, they have to take their, it takes their blood pressure over 24 hours and that can also tell you if you have high blood pressure. But otherwise at home, if they do have high blood pressure, we want to make sure they're checking their, their blood pressure monitoring device, make sure it's accurate, and making sure that it's not causing, uh, you know, that they're taking it before they take the blood pressure medications, for sure. All right, so teaching for hypertension. So it's the same A, B, C, D, E's, right? The same things you say for ASCVD, the same things you do for a CHF are the same things you teach for hypertension. So that's nice. It's all the same. All right, just to point out that you know, E2H, please don't do E2H. E2H is a direct vasoconstrictor. That's, that's something that we want to avoid if possible, but it's cool for two beers for guys, one beer for ladies, and they, they calculate how much alcohol is like 1.5 grams of ethanol or something. Not sure who's in a bar like measuring, oh, wait, 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 let me measure the ethanol on that one, All right? But yeah, you wanna limit that, definitely not binge drinking. And then uh, weight loss is going to be important. Every one kilo you lose can, lose can be a one point drop in your blood pressure, right? It's like, well, my blood pressure is 70. It's like I lost 120 kilos. So you gotta, it's got to be realistic, right? So that less than 130 over 80 is, our, is just our target. All right, they can, they can go lower, it's fine. But weight loss is important. There's something called the waist to height ratio, which is looking at their waist size and their height. They should, there should be a certain target they need for to show that they're under control, right? They reduce their waist size. That's going to reduce their hypertensive risk. Thought I put it there, so how, how much it is. But either way, diet is an important piece of hypertension because the more sodium you put in your diet, the more water is going to follow it, and you're going to get hypertension. So low sodium diet, about one gram per day, is what you want, and that's can that can drop your uh, blood pressure about five points if we stick to that. Right, especially effective in African Americans and elderly. What has high sodium in it? Salt. That's a good answer. <laughs> you know what? You, know, like you, you take like a teaspoon of honey at night. <laughs> Don't take a teaspoon of salt, please. <laughs> reduce your <laughs> reduce those teaspoons. What else? Canned so canned foods have a lot of processed salts, right? They have, or not processed, but a lot of processed foods have a lot of salt in it. So the fresher, the better is, is the idea, okay? No soy sauce at the table, salt at the table, right? Don't add salt to your food is a good recommendation. And then high potassium diets. So high potassium diet is recommended and it, what potassium does is it inhibits the sodium channels in the kidneys. So it makes you pee more. It's like a diuretic in of itself. This is great until they get kidney disease. If they get kidney disease, you don't, you no longer recommend this. But if they don't have kidney disease, a high potassium diet is recommended. And then we got a plant-based diet still wins over Mediterranean, which wins over the DASH diet. DASH diet is the dietary advantages. I forgot what it is for. Uh, it's like it's like a plain diet basically. All right. And again, avoid processed foods. Licorice raises your blood pressure. Uh, black licorice and bitter orange raise your blood pressure by 10 points every time you eat it. So don't, don't do licorice. And then stress, BP can be reduced by, by 10 points with stress reduction te technologies, uh, techniques, uh, such as, I guess you get the new Apple Vision and then get, reduce your tech, reduce your, your stress, but you can do a um, yoga, acupuncture, massage therapy, biofeedback, right? My, my blood pressure will be low, my blood pressure will be low. And that will then reduce your blood pressure. Okay, and avoiding air pollution. So if you can move, move. That, that is, move away from Long Beach, move away from the uranium sands of the Rosamond Desert, right? You can do those things to, to reduce your hypertension. It's a true story. <laughs> All right, so the orthostasis. So these are other teaching properties or teaching things you would do is to make sure they get up slowly, make sure they are checking their blood pressure. If their blood pressure is, is dropping by 20 over 10, 
all right, 20 points systolic or 10 points diastolic, that is orthostasis. So in the hospital, we can, we can assess this and say, hey, you're, you have orthostatic hypotension. We gotta fix that. We might have to adjust the medications. We might have to encourage them what we can to make sure they get up slowly, make sure they're drinking extra fluid. And what's going on is the baroreceptor is, is firing off what it expects to fire off at. It's like it's been doing this for 70 years. It knows how to raise your blood pressure when you stand up. All of a sudden, if you give a vasodilator, like a beta blocker or cash in a blocker or whatever is going to reduce your blood pressure, it's not used to that amount of change. So it might take a second for them to adjust to that. But otherwise, one of the things you would recommend is, uh, sorry, is to rise slowly, make sure they're hydrated. And then what kind of symptoms might they get when they rise, rise too fast? Obviously, hypotension. But they get this really, really bad headache, coat hanger headache. And they get visual blurring. They get their, their vision starts darkening, and they can fall over. So that's an important thing to, rec to recognize uh, with blood pressure medications. And we might have to take them off the blood pressure medications and even start on medications to raise their blood pressure. So these medications, midadrine and fludrocortisone, actually raise the blood pressure. Midadrine being an alpha-1 agonist. It binds the alpha-1 receptors, vasoconstricts, and raises the blood pressure. Fludrocortisone is a fancy word for aldosterone. We're just giving them aldosterone. Okay. And we talk about neuro, there's some neuro medications here like our Parkinson's meds that will also cause um, orthostasis. All right, so this is the idea behind what to teach a hypertensive patient.